Pop Shield, a long-form discussion podcast about musical topics both past and present. I'm Gabe, and I'm joined as always by Dan. Hello. And Derek. Hello. So whenever we're trying to decide on an episode topic, we usually look for some kind of justification, no matter how flimsy, whether that's something in the news, an anniversary, or even just a listener email. And by the way, you can email us at popshieldpod at gmail.com if you have any good topic ideas. Well, this week, we actually came up with a handful of reasons to talk about Joy Division. Not only is the 40th anniversary of lead singer Ian Curtis's death coming up next month, but Darren admitted that Joy Division has never really clicked for him, so we thought it would be fun to try to fix that. Meanwhile, I spent so much time listening to Joy Division in high school that I was worried they wouldn't really do it for me anymore, and to top it all off, they have a song called Isolation that really speaks to our current coronavirus moment, I think. For reasons we'll get into in a minute, we made the controversial decision to focus specifically on the band's second and last LP, Closer, from 1980. But we've also got the unique opportunity to reassess Joy Division's frankly stunning legacy from the perspective of both seasoned veterans and a relative newcomer. Now, before we dive into the album, I think we should address the decision I just alluded to. Dan, what do you think about introducing Darren to Joy Division through Closer instead of Unknown Pleasures? For my money, Closer is definitely superior, but maybe you can also talk a little bit about your previous opinions on these two albums. I mean, you know, it it just seems when a band like this, uh, you know, they've only got two records, you know, really, and then, and they're both like classics, it just sort of feels wrong to start with the second one, you know, and it's like you definitely have to listen to both of them, so it's like weird to start with the second one, but I mean, they're, they're both like such classics that... I, I think if it's going to click for you, either one uh, will be fine. Mm. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, Closer was the one that I started with. And so it definitely did it for me. Um, you know, to give a little bit of the background on my personal history, it's like Joy Division was definitely like one of the bands of my high school years. Like, mm-hmm. listen to them obsessively, maybe almost more than anybody else. Um, I was actually thinking, you know, it's funny because, like, as I was listening, um, these memories were coming back and it was just funny how like I, I went to an Interpol show. This is like one of like the first couple concerts I'd ever been to. Cause it was hard to get, you know, your parents to drive you all the way to Orlando to see a concert. But, um, you know, I get out of the concert. There's like a Virgin mega store, like right nearby and we're waiting to get picked up. You know, this was at like downtown Disney used to be called. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just reading like these different music magazines. I see one that has Interpol on the cover and it says something about, like, are they just Joy Division ripoffs? And I was like, who the <laughs> fuck is Joy Division, you know? So I start reading about it, and I get, like, so caught up, and we'll talk about it, but, like, in the mythology behind them and their backstory and everything, I, like, had to get it. And I just thought it was funny because I went and looked, and all they had was closer, and it the jewel case was cracked, but I still had to have it. Um, and then I picked up another album I had been wanting to check out, Velvet Underground and Nico. It's like, what a day. That's a day. You know what I mean, yeah. <laughs> the same That's day. Insane. I'm like <laughs> experiencing Joy Division and Velvet Underground at the same time. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah I but I assume. replicate that. Uh... No, I mean, when is that ever going to happen again? <laughs> um, but yeah, so Dan, basically, you're in agreement, right? That like Joy Division was like really central to your upbringing, listening to them thousands and thousands of times. Oh, yeah, of course. I I don't have like such a good story. I really don't even uh, remember exactly when or (laughs) where I heard them. But um, yeah, I mean, that was just something, you know, you you just come uh, become obsessed with like in high school, you know, uh, uh, up through college. And I mean, I mean, even to this day, I would I would call myself a a huge fan. I've read, you know, books about them, you know, Mm. everything I get my hands on, you know, I've any live thing, whatever. I've heard it, seen all those movies, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So. Darren, I'm curious, like what, like how much previous familiarity do you have with Joy Division and why do you think it never clicked for you? Yeah, I mean, it's so strange because everything that you guys are describing sounds like things that I would say about, you know, bands that I really love or Mm. that were formative to my high school years. And, you know, obviously we went to high school together, so I was close to you guys, um, especially you, Gabe, in terms of your Joy Division obsession. And it just never really... Um, just never really clicked with me. Um, I do recall, you know, we were in a band, obviously. I remember you playing the bass line from Isolation quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, always thought that was cool or whatever, but I, I, I don't know. It's, it's really, it's just really weird because I think throughout those years, we were kind of constantly 
influencing one another with one band that we discovered or liked or something yeah. like that. And uh, Joy Division is just one that seems to have like fallen through the cracks for me. So just over the years, um, I think I've always had closer on my iPod, um, mm. and I've you know certainly listened to it. Um, you know, Atrocity Exhibition is kind of like i've heard it so many times because i probably for the dozens and dozens of times i've tried to start it you know what i mean that yeah being the yeah. first song um but uh you know the big single like level tears apart you know i i liked it but and and i did understand a bit of the story and you know a bit of that background and mythology i guess but it just didn't really sink in i guess all right well we'll see how it goes this time and i do think that you know Maybe like Dan is right that you kind of could pick either album, but I do think it's kind of important to just pick one of the albums. And, you know, like we live in this world where it's like you got to, um, you know, you just tempt, are tempted to like download everything, mm -hmm. you know, at once. Yeah. And um, maybe it was like good fortune that there was only one CD at this store <laughs> that I was stuck with for a while. In fact, I couldn't find Unknown Pleasures. Like I ended up ordering it online, which was maybe the first time in my life I ordered a CD <laughs> online, you know? Um, but uh, anyway, let's dive in to Closer. Um, Dan, maybe you can start by, you know, describing, you know, it feels weird, but if somebody had just never heard of Joy Division, I mean, what does Closer sound like? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's a little hard to... to um to explain because you know you want to use the words like post-punk because they're sort of like right, right. i think the seminal band but because they're the seminal band it's it's you know like defining a word you know using that word in in the sentence you know um right. so i i guess you you would say you know it's sort of this like kind of sparse like uh you know empty-ish uh instrumentation with like uh just a real real you know goth sounding sort of echoey uh instrumentation like uh, the drums are sort of like uh almost sound like a, um that you know they sound like real drums but they like verge on sounding fake you know um yeah very mechanical yeah yeah mechanical is a great word and then the singer is <laughs> like this guy who uh <laughs> sounds very strange like I, I think it's it's one of the like um, difficult things to get into about Joy Division. Um, he's, he he does not like what you would call a you know a good singer. You know he he's sort of like almost almost talking. Uh, how how would you describe yeah. how the sound? How I, mean, his I, voice I feel like, that, you I know? feel like Jim Morrison is kind of a, a yeah. you know an, a quick and easy way to at least start. You know what I mean? That's what that's what kind of came to mind as soon as I started listening. It, obviously, it's not, but I mean. It's yeah, I think it's very, very in that same school where it's like sort of this baritone voice. Yeah. It's often this like, you know, he 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 does do like more of a talk style, you know, singing. But, you know, it's like it's still half singing and it does kind of remind me of those portions of like the doors, the end. Right. Where he's like kind of. Yeah. Yeah. That's you a in point. a way or yeah, telling yeah. you a story or something. Um, and yet his voice is not so smooth, you know, as Jim Morrison. Um he like sounds like a like a crooner who like actually can't hold a note or something like that um but it you know we'll talk more about it but it's got like kind of a jagged like imperfection quality that really suits the music um you know you mentioned how everything is quite sparse and it feels like nothing is really gelling together you've just got these kind of like jagged like off kilter rhythms and kind of like mm -hmm. you know weird like jerky bass lines and stuff um you know it doesn't sound like they did a million takes till they got the bass line perfectly right you know <laughs> like the guitar is kind of screeching somewhere like kind of in a distant way um and just everything sounds like it's barely hanging together like you know just like about to fall apart um but what would you add how would you describe this album Darren? um i mean i'm gonna use kind of a bit more general terms because I, I was just trying to do a lot of ob or thinking about a lot of like observations about the sound and stuff. So, like, like I mentioned, Jim Morrison kind of immediately came to mind when Ian Curtis started singing, sing talking or whatever. Uh. Um, instrument instrumentation wise, like I, I, I just, it sounds very like kind of like clean, like, you know, um, hmm. uh, I guess like a lot of like trouble, you know what I mean? Like it just doesn't, there, there are like moments of, you know, bassiness, I guess it, I, it just sounds, you, you mentioned mechanical, like I like that, like almost tin, tin canny, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that, mm -hmm. that's yeah. kind of what, I get that. 
Um, it is true because like yeah. the bass is is often playing very high, right? And it you know it's like the bass line is usually where almost all the melody is coming from. Sometimes the only melody is like the bass line, and so it's usually playing quite high and like very prominent in the mix. Um, and you, yeah, you usually have these kind of like the drums are more like dull thuds than you know like booming John Bonham or something like that. Um, and then yeah, there's like you know you both mentioned it, but so much empty space in the mm-hmm. mix, um, which I want to focus on more in a second. But it's like the most trebly tin can style guitars, like the shittiest amp you could ever imagine, right? <laughs> um, and then nothing in the middle, and then basically like toms, bass, and a baritone singer, you know, all, all in the lower register. You know what I mean? So it like makes, and then you've got the, a lot of use of delay and stuff, which really makes you, you know, pay attention to the empty space in the mix. And you know, you know what I mean, Darren? Like, you're just like so aware of like all of the emptiness here. Yes. Yes. And when you mentioned like the effects, like if there's like an echo or something, it's so clear to hear that echo because there's like enough space for it to be heard you know what i mean like there's really nothing that's like filling it it you know i can almost imagine the band either like on stage or in the studio playing in the space between them you know what i mean like it it just doesn't it's hard to describe like i can it it gives me a visual but kind of like what you were suggesting makes sense i I don't know how to yeah put it yeah i mean i think what's what's weird is that you know, and again, we're doing, you know, you would just sort of say like post punk, uh, but there's a problem with defining them as post punk, like you said, Dan, because they are almost like inventing this style in a lot of ways um, or very much innovating it. Um, but, you know, if you were describing this like in 1979, 1980, um, you know, it, you would describe it maybe as like punk played very slow or something like that. Like, you know what I mean, Dan? Do you still hear it as punk music? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, like like you said, with the there's like a a bit of a, a jaggedness to it. Like it's it's just sort of hanging on. Um, you know, it doesn't sound like professional and and polished. Um, you know, it still has that like punk edge. And I think I think Ian's voice, like like I said, him he's not like what you would classify as like a, a good singer. Um, mm. And that you know that's a very like punk thing to just have like you know a guy that like. It, it feels like it's like he the, these words and stuff are just things like he needs to get out and like right it's right. not that like you know he's not frank sinatra or some shit you know <laughs> yeah 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 there's like kind of that urgency that amateurism um you know i think that it, it's interesting because it never really like clicked with me until this week um and i should mention that i, I hadn't really revisited this in like a very long time to be honest um and we'll talk about why in a minute but you know, I was reading the Wikipedia, which we didn't have back in those days when I was in high school. There was no Wikipedia, <laughs> but um, it was explaining that basically about half the songs were written in one at one period, like in the late 70s, and they're more guitar based, you know, mm-hmm. and then the other half were written later in 1980, and they're more synth based. And the band was kind of, you know, everybody likes to say that the band was kind of moving in this like more synth heavy direction and that you know basically new order would like carry that into fruition um and of course it's fun to think about what joy division would have been if if uh, ian curtis hadn't died but um you know i i think we could start to break it down in that way right because we talk about it as jagged and punkish and and everything and yet there are some songs that are like very you know would you describe them as lush especially some of these last songs you know like very elegaic and like very um you know they they just sound like grand and dark like you know like a brooding opera or something like that you know what i mean yeah i mean you know the the on, on those songs like the synthesizer um becomes more uh prominent more more use um and so i mean at any time like the synthesizer i think fills more space like in the mix and everything um and and has that that uh you know big kind of quality to it um so yeah i i don't think it is it's not like so obvious uh where like the album doesn't seem um cohesive or anything you know it, it still sounds like one band and you know uh, an album but i mean i think yeah there's definitely like a uh a shift that you can you can tell between uh certain tracks yeah what do you, i mean what do you think about that darren do you do you hear it as like two different styles you know it's almost like it's almost divided by halves because basically 
Isolation is like the only synth heavy track on the first half, and um, 24 Hours is the only guitar heavy track on the second half. Um, but do you hear it as kind of like two different styles, Darren? I mean, when we talk about it like this, yes, but just upon listening, like I didn't feel like there was like such a huge shift that my attention was suddenly drawn into like, well, where did the guitar go? You know what I mean? And that mm-hmm. might be because, you know, I didn't necessarily find the guitar all that interesting. Um, <laughs> so when it, go- when it goes away, you know, I I think of it more of like a, okay, I'm, I'm kind of digging a change of pace. You know what I mean? Like, um, I liked the the introduction of the synth um uh, and i liked more of it in the second half of the album so yeah i mean it well when you put it on paper yes two it sounds like two different things but i mean like dan said i i still think it's fairly cohesive i think the overall mood is still um pretty much you know good you know or the same throughout you know what i mean yeah well let's interrogate that a little sure. bit because you know like, what do you mean when you say that, you know, you don't find the guitar that interesting? It is, it is like, it is weird to to realize sort of that the record starts off, you know, just so abrasively. You know, you talked about how many times you've listened to Atrocity Exhibition and probably not gotten farther than that, you know, because the, you know, the rhythm section is doing its own kind of like jerky can style kind of thing um, with these like rolling toms and stuff. But the guitar is basically just in pure noise territory. It's just like screeching feedback, like malfunctioning equipment sounds like static electricity or something sometimes. Um, and you kind of get several songs in the first half that are like that. And then it kind of, yeah, it sort of feels maybe like, um, a nice transition, how it sort of smoothly turns into more like lush synth sounds. Um, but you know, maybe I answered it for you, but why do you (laughs) dislike those guitar sounds, Darren? Well, you know, and I try to give this a lot of thought because, you know, I know that the effort here was to, you know, for this, to, for me to admit that it was a blunder and then admit that it was like an amazing album. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know if it was like just the way, you know, it was recorded or the way certain things are played. You know, I'm thinking of like, you know, Passover has, you know, a distorted guitar that kind of plays. And I don't know, I, I guess when when I th- I'm thinking about like other bands that we've talked about, you know, uh, my bloody Valentine, for instance, you know, even like bands that I was listening to in high school, Nirvana, like there's things about the instruments that for me sound like I've never heard it before, you know? And I guess mm-hmm. here, and this could be just a, you know, the problem of me listening to it so much later, nothing sounds new, I guess. Like the guitar sound doesn't mm. like blow me away or like, Oh, this is like something I've never heard before. Or, I want to pick up a guitar and start playing it. Like it just doesn't give me that kind of, it doesn't want to get me that engaged. You know what I mean? Interesting. I mean, what, what do you think about that, Dan? Because I guess, you know, I can understand that. And this is going to, well, as we'll talk about, like it's going to become like one of the like most copied things or most influential things, like, you know, in all of music. Um, And yet, you know, you know, so on one hand, I agree, like when I hear like the screeching guitars, you know, I can imagine that sounding like very novel in 1980. Um, But, you know, now it's like nothing new. And yet there I think there are instrumental aspects to this album that still sound surprising, you know, or 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 new. Um, Is it the same for you? I mean, I, I get what, what Darren says about, like, it doesn't really, like, make you want to pick up the guitar and, and learn to play the songs, you know. Um, like, I understand that part. And and I guess I get that, like, if, if you came to this later, that maybe it doesn't sound novel because, um, you know, it's been copied so much. Um, you know, I mean, because th- those those like really noisy guitar sounds, especially like that, that opening, you know, uh, part of atrocity exhibition. Um, I think like really sort of grabbed me when I was younger and, and everything. Cause this was maybe one of the first times I, I had heard like uh, a guitar yeah, that, that wasn't just like, you know, something like Nirvana, you know, I mean, I, I had listened to Nirvana like before this, uh, you know, something like endless nameless or, or something that's like real noise, you know, it's, it's a different sort of like, you know, that's like a, a reckless, like, you know, uh, rocking out kind of noise where this is just like uh, industrial sort of sounds. Um, and I think this is like probably the first like, you know, industrial type sounding uh, a record I had ever heard. Um, you know, so, so that like really grabbed me. But I think like the the um, 
the drums here sound like really awesome and like i i play the drums and i i've always like loved the drums on this record like they they do sort of make me like atrocity exhibitions like super fun to play um you know like they do grab me and and make me want to to play those songs um and just just the the sound of the drums like how like like you said earlier like you know they don't have this like big booming uh you know bottom kind of sound they they like sound weird and tinny and like um you know flat um where like they almost sound uh synthetic but not quite you know and uh that that's like super interesting to me i think yeah i mean for me it's like the arrangements are still like mind boggling because you know like atrocity exhibition like what the fuck is that you know what i mean like mm-hmm. that's not even a song it's just like like think about the structure of that thing it's like just these rolling toms the quote unquote chorus <laughs> like the only hook of the song is you know if you don't count the tom roll it's like <laughs> when the little snare hits are added to the tom roll you know what i mean like that's uh-huh. the most catchy thing that happens in the song um you've got that you've got like sort of these like you know the, and then he like the he sings the chorus which is like this is the way step inside and then it it crescendos in just the screeches come back you know what i mean like that's all the song is there's almost there's almost no musicality to the song whatsoever i think about other parts like um passover you know during the entire verse like you know because the hook quote unquote is like a bass line that's like do 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 you know like yeah. that's it and then during the verse the bass isn't even playing it's right. just like hitting palm mute notes like clink, 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 clink. and no bass no nothing but like this little beat and these occasional electronic like doom doom you know like that's it that's the whole fucking song and colony right is so start stop and stuttery with like these random rolls i'm like what are they doing you know you know what i'm saying darren like does that impress you even if you don't find it so pleasant to listen to somewhat um you know i i feel like for me to engage with it the way you are so engaged with it i feel like it has to be interesting to listen to you know musically too you know what i mean like i can appreciate exactly what you just described but you know i don't feel <laughs> it's so i feel so like lame <laughs> like like it why isn't it working for me but um <laughs> you know like uh you know what i mean like when you when you're just like everybody loves this one thing and you just can't seem to get it or you don't feel moved by it at all um uh, it's just really t- tough like and, and it's not like i just hated it or wanted to turn it off it never felt that way i just don't feel particularly moved you know everything just kind of felt okay like that's all right do you, do you think you that know, maybe that's that has to do with like the mood of the record? You know, I mean the and the well, mood of the band in general. It being like such a like depressive. I mean, like yeah, like even well, b- the, besides the lyrics, like even just like the music sounds. Like, sure, because like I mean, I almost you know? wonder like what if I never heard Nirvana? You know what I mean? What if I just started listening to Nirvana now in my thirties? Like, would mm-hmm. I be blown away? I don't. Maybe not. You know, maybe it would just be very similar to yeah. this, like where it's like, okay, I've you know, this is fine. I don't get it. I don't get why everyone's obsessed with it. Like I'm, I'm, I kind of worry with this band in general that maybe I just missed the boat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interesting. I mean, yeah, that is something I want to talk. I mean, I want to get into the lyrics in, in a minute, but it's like, you know, I, I just, for me, it's like, I, I just kept coming back to these arrangements. You know, I, I'm thinking of like the eternal, which is like almost the, it's just almost one note, the entire song, you know, you've got the little piano line on top of it, but the bass is just playing one note. The whole time or like you know decades the end of decades is like so grand and yeah. such a just feels like such a momentous occasion because it's the first time that they're like changing chords in almost the whole freaking album you know what i mean like when the bass line starts descending you know as like the you know over the outro and everything it's like the most melodic thing here um and you know to me it's like I can't help but appreciate the, you know, the strangeness of that, like the inventiveness of that. I think it still sounds very inventive and, you know, pretty daring. But another thing I want to ask though, um, and maybe you can answer this, Dan, is like, you know, they're so clearly inspired by, you know, let's say like Bowie's Berlin period. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that they're sort of like gesturing toward these pretty like sophisticated soundscapes, like the kind you find on the second half of low and heroes by David Bowie. Um, 
And yet there's like an amateurishness to their music, which we talked about. And it just feels sometimes like a band, you know, like in a garage that can only afford like shitty Casios from thrift stores trying to make, you know, um, Brian Eno music. Um, do, do you like, you know what I mean? Cause sometimes I'm just like, how is this atmospheric at all? You know, it's just like, like you think about like the, the synths and stuff on decades, you know, just like, it's just like the shittiest, tinniest sounding thing. Do you don't understand what I'm getting at? Like, how is it possible that the music sounds so like atmospheric and interesting in an ambient sense when it simultaneously sounds so primitive? I think like the, a, a lot of the like ambience of it comes from like, what's missing you know like like we said there's not there's not much like middle there's really like even the the low end is is not like you know fully there you know the the low end is almost the middle and and there's almost no low end um and and so it, it, i don't know it just has like this strange um I, I don't know like like mood about like the music like like c- completely forget like the you know what words he's saying i mean his his voice uh in and of itself like contributes to it but i think just like it feels like depression you know like like it's just like sort of empty and like you know downtrodden sort of feeling uh, and, and just these like you know sort of uh you know like a painful kind of noises um you know i don't i don't mean painful and like as neg- you know it's not like a, a bad l- record to listen to it's just like you know like the screeching guitar you know it's not like you know what what normally is considered like a pleasant sound you know um but but yeah i think you're right like um you know you can see like there is some sort of like um you know berlin kind of trilogy uh you know thing like they're they're going for here but yeah they don't have that like you know million dollar studio budget that that right. that bowie had and stuff you know and uh i mean they're definitely uh inspired by it you know i'm sure you know this uh ian was listening to uh one of those records uh the idiot by iggy papa when he killed himself right right um yeah and i mean i think it just it's like a good description of the sound which is like if a band with like the shittiest equipment and no money tried to recreate like the second half of low Mm -hmm. you know or something like you you hear that amateurism um and also on something else you mentioned you know it, it does sort of seem like you know his his singing ian curtis it's like he sounds like not that into it or something you know what i mean like he sounds like like drugged or like yeah it's like that or something it's like that depression kind of thing like you know you can't enjoy right. the things that you enjoy and like he, right. he seems like that you know like you you can um y- y- you know you can almost like tell like he 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 wants to get these words out and stuff but it's like it's almost hard to bother doing it you know and i think that like adds so much to the like moodiness of of the record yeah so i mean you know, what do you think about that, Darren? Did you find this album like crushingly depressing, like hard to listen to for that reason? Not really. I mean, certainly not in the way that you feel when you listen to like Mount Erie. Um, you know what I mean? Um, uh, but, you you know, I think that it was pretty clear without even having to like read into the lyrics or even knowing much about Ian Curtis and his suicide that it's a dark record, you know, like the color, I think black really comes to mind throughout, um, a lot of shadows, you know, like his voice is very eerie sounding, you know, I think actually this whole album kind of sounds eerie, um, uh, like a black and white old school like horror movie almost um uh, and i think that that says a lot without even having to like read the lyrics specifically like i think if you can if you can sort of evoke that sort of mood and the that sort of imagery just from the music and the sound of your voice i mean i i think that it um says a lot once you read into his death and a bit more into the band like it i think it adds more to the album as a whole but um without all of that i think it it definitely kind of achieves this sort of like um spooky sort of mood i guess maybe not spooky but definitely like very moody brooding you know haunting yeah yeah Yeah, i mean so i think this is like a fundamental question with joy division um which is like you know how much the backstory plays into things and you know, I guess like the short version, maybe you can tell me what I'm missing, Dan, is like 
like what appealed to me when I was in high school, right? Like these, these <laughs> epic backstories really, really got me, uh, when yeah. I was in high school, but you know, just that he's basically, he, he kills himself at 23 years old, which is like unbelievable. Crazy. Uh, Crazy. You know, when I was in high school, I was like, well, he was pretty old. But, you know, no, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> um, he lived a full life, um, but, <laughs> but you know, um, so basically he's like suffering from, um, epilepsy that he like develops uh, like during his time as a band. Um, and he's like, basically it's like being, you know, performing on stage and stuff is like actually triggering his seizures and things like that. Very miserable for him and very embarrassing for him. Um, he's simultaneously in a marriage with a daughter um but having an affair and so his marriage is like constantly falling apart um and he seems to just in general have like this kind of paranoia and guilt and stuff going on and so basically he commits suicide and this album comes out like a month or two later um and ever since you know it's tempting to just read every single line as like declaring his intent to commit suicide you know you think about things like the album title closer has this double meaning with closer right um the eternal he's like literally describing like watching his own funeral it's like hard to argue that that's not what it's about um and yet usually you know nine times out of ten it's a mistake to read that much like autobiography into things you know Mm -hmm. like people say Oh, you know, if you listen to like the unplugged album, you know, like Kurt knew he was going to commit suicide. Like, I'm not so sure about that. Right. But, you know, is this different, Dan? Like, is it helpful or actually kind of a problem to read so much of his life into this album? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like so hard not to because I feel like, you know, when, when the band was like actually, you know, uh, around they weren't that famous you know they, they were you know most people didn't mm-hmm. know about them unless you were in the area or whatever uh, and so it's like sort of almost everybody who like knows these records like got into them after right. that mythology had been um you know established and and everything so it's like few people like really know it without that mythology i mean i i don't think i don't think i ever knew it without knowing that he had like had killed himself and stuff so it's it's hard not right. to read into it i mean I, I I look atrocity exhibition is like based on uh, uh like some book um that I've never yeah. read um you know so like but then also you know I know people always say that like it's like him talking about himself you know like you you mentioned like him having epilepsy and it's like you know uh, for entertainment they watch his body twist uh, behind his eyes he says right, I still right. exist like that you know that's like somebody he would have these fits on stage and and people would cheer because. Th- I guess we should also right. mention that he like when he wasn't having epileptic fits, he um he has this very strange dance that he does. Um right, right. and so like people like when he would have these fits, like people would just sort of think it was like this dance uh, you know, ramping up, I guess, and you know, and, right. until he would collapse or, or whatever. Um and so like I, I if you believe that it's just about this book that he's read, then you are like reading too much into it when you when you you know look at the epilepsy thing but also i mean this is a you know something like you said like with unplugged like with kurt cobain i don't i don't i I agree with you i don't think that like you know people he was planning his own funeral and all this stuff like i I don't believe all that but i mean right uh, ian seems like a much more of a like deeply depressed um like person he has like a lot of things like going very badly in his life you know i mean the band is 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 poor at this point um his marriage is falling apart he's like afraid of losing his daughter um he's he's you know got this you know this epilepsy it's like affecting like the band like is like the basically the doctor like tells him like he cannot tour like hit Uh and stuff like him him staying up late and like doing all these this this activity and stuff is like causing the epilepsy to get worse and everything you know so it's I, I, I feel like there's no way that that's not like crept into his lyrics somehow. Yeah. But I mean, I, yeah. I feel like the only way you could ever actually know is for him to say it. And, you know, we yeah. don't have that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's like the lyrics are cryptic enough that you can read every line this yeah. way. But what were you going to say, Darren? Yeah, I just had a, a question because, like, I'm obviously much more familiar with Kurt Cobain's story, and there already sounds like some similarities. But, you know, there's something that. I'm curious about Dan that maybe you can answer um, between Ian and and Kurt here. You know, Kurt, for what it's worth, through his depression and drug problems and everything, you know, he also wrote supposedly, right, on 
his um was it on the suicide note or something about like better to burn out than the fade away um this like implication that like he understood he was a rock star and he was huge and he didn't want to suddenly like fail you know what i mean like he didn't want to be a failure so it's almost like he understood that like dying would somehow create a legend out of out of nirvana and himself yeah i don't i don't even have that same sort of thought no i don't i don't I I don't think so. I I don't remember if there's a, a suicide note or if it's ever been released. If there is, um, but it's definitely like um, basically what happened is like uh, Ian's wife uh, Deborah, like they she was finally done with him and was kicking him out, and uh, so he he went home. And if I'm getting this right, I haven't read these books in years, uh, so this is off the top of my head. So don't at me but uh <laughs> like you know so he he's he's going to the house uh ostensibly to like get his belongings and stuff um and, and leave but what he does is he goes in and he kills himself and she finds him later that day or the next day whatever it is um so you know it's it, it's it's much more like and literally just his personal life was like so shitty you know with his depression that it caused him to kill himself. You know, there's none of this like, oh, I want to be a hero or martyr, you know, kind of stuff that gets applied to Kurt. I don't, I don't, I don't think that any of that really applies. And as far as I know, I don't think Ian yeah. was like on drugs or anything. Well, yeah, I mean, I was, um, you know, I was reading like following along with the lyrics on like genius.com, you know, and there's like a line on the song heart and soul where he says existence. Well, what does it matter? I exist on the best terms I can. The past is now part of my future. The present is well out of hand. Um, you know, and they kind of glossed it as like him thinking about, you know, like basically his legacy or something like that. Like just his, the way his his past is going to become all that's ever known about him or, you know, stuff like that. And I can get that in sort of like a maybe it's a stretch, right, to connect it to his thoughts about his like musical legacy or something like that. But, you know, it's I do think there's sometimes like this not like martyrdom to his art or something, you know, as explicitly as with Kurt, but something about like, you know, everything would be better or something like if I did this, you know, there, there, I, there's those, those aspects. I think the big thing is, is like Kurt was already very famous when he did it. Um, you know, like at this point, like Joy Division is, is not f- really famous at all. Um, and I think, right. that's and a, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't think you're going to become a hero when like your record sold yeah. 2000 copies, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kurt was like more or less on top of the world, you know. Exactly. And he had originally set out to be a rock star. He had already accomplished that basically, and then right made that decision. So, yeah, I think I think that's a key difference. Um, and before we move on from Nirvana, a, a trivia effect I learned: Courtney Love claimed that she lost her virginity to the song "Colony" Damn. off of this record. <laughs> so, the more you know. Um, <laughs> But I, I just have this feeling, I had this feeling all week that it's like a bit of a shame. Like, I agree that it's impossible to separate the backstory from this album, but it's just like a bit of a shame that it hangs so much over the entire experience. Because if he hadn't like, you know, if he hadn't committed suicide, it would probably just be like a an amazing record the way that like the cures pornography yeah. is, right? Like, if you if you told me, you know, like, I didn't know better and you were like, yeah, the guy who made pornography like killed himself afterwards, I'd be like, well, I can hear that. But, you know, for him, it... it <laughs> It didn't go that route, right? Um, and it's just like a cool as hell record, like an incredible mood is is created, and blah, you know, and it would be the same here. And I try as hard as I can to listen to it in that way because I just think it's like a little boring. It's like a little bit of a dead end to just like read every line that way. You know, sometimes he is like just sort of creating stories and images and narratives and stuff. And you know, the music isn't like you know the band was not keyed in to what was going on with Ian. You know what I mean? It's not like they were like we need to make the perfect music for his funeral. You know what I mean? With, no, the, with yeah. the eternal. Right. Like, in, in fact, yeah. it's like the opposite. Like they, like, um, I, I read like Peter Hook wrote, wrote a book about his time in Joy Division. And like, uh, the whole thing is like, they essentially like never paid attention to Ian's lyrics. You know, they were just like lyrics and, you know, they, they didn't really even like realize he was depressed and stuff, you know? Um, so really, yeah, it's like very far from the truth for, for the band. You know, they, they weren't planning that at all. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I, I just, I, I would like recommend trying to, you know, maybe if you're, if you, if that appeals to you, the whole mythos, sure. But like, you know how, like when we, we were talking about the doors on that previous episode and it's like, you know, Jim Morrison is just kind of a dick and it's like, forget mm-hmm. about it. Like just get into the record. You know what I mean? And, yeah. um, I feel like it's helpful here. Um, I want to ask you though, Darren, like, is it possible 
to enjoy this record or appreciate this record when you aren't like a moody teenager with a flair for drama? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I think that's my struggle, right? Um, Coming into this and not being a moody teenager, um, I really found it difficult to connect, you know? And again, I keep talking about Nirvana because I think it's important to point out that, you know, this is... the difference for me personally between these two bands is like just timing. It feels like, you know, I was a moody teenager when I was listening to moody Nirvana right. music. Uh, why Joy Division didn't appeal to me then, I don't know. But, you know, I seemed like the right audience um, for this type of music. Listening to it now, you know, it's just really hard. It's like a... It's like there's just like this wall here and it's just very difficult to crack and want to relate. You know what I mean? Um, And for me personally, a 23 year old committing suicide almost makes it more difficult for me to want to relate to that. You know what I mean? I'm so far beyond Uh that idea of like, (laughs) how cool is that? Or like, (laughs) he lives such, he lives such a great life, you know, or Hey, my life's going to end when I'm 23 too. All of that, that we you know used to joke around about that's so far beyond now. And like, you know, I, I don't think it's impossible, you know what I mean? And I, and I, I like this, like, I don't hate it. Um, but I just can't find myself being moved by it, influenced by it per se, but more of just like a, an appreciation for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, what would you say, Dan, um, to somebody and by somebody, I guess, I mean, Darren, who is struggling to get over that hurdle of like, this is, you know, I'm just not in the headspace like I was when I was young, you know, like how, how would you listen to this then? I mean, I think, I think it's almost like a, a, a decent argument, you know, if you, you're not in that headspace or you've like never been in that headspace or, or something like, I think it might be sort of difficult to like, um, you know, understand. It's like, you know, if you were, you know, if you're having like a great day, do you really want to do you want to watch like a, a real sad movie? You know, it's like, no, not really. You know, that that's like it's you're not in the headspace for it or, or whatever. Uh, and I think that sort of can apply with music. I, I definitely think it can apply with music. You know, I mean, there, there's times you, you feel like listening to Joy Division and there's sometimes, you know, I when we were trying to figure out an episode, you guys kept suggesting real depressive shit. And I was like, you know, <laughs> I don't really want to be doing, you know, sitting here in, in quarantine with all the coronavirus shit you know i don't want to be sitting here inside baseball going on here okay and then you you tricked me by picking one of my favorite bands (laughs) but (laughs) but you know like you know that's the thing like i don't i you know i i think the headspace like sort of does matter and i think that is like a a big reason why like you know darren has a problem uh getting into it you know i mean it still holds up for for me like as an adult like i think one of the like nostalgia for it and uh yeah, moody adult so it works <laughs> i mean it, well i think nostal- i think nostalgia is really important you know when yeah, we had yeah that definitely Nirvana episode you know i was like loving it and enjoying it but it, a lot of it had to do with the fact that it was like a it was a nostalgia trip that's what it was you know yeah and i mean it, it, well it's just weird right because like if you get into something at the right time you can listen to it forever because mm-hmm. you can then like remember the headspace. Yes, but if you yes. miss it, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, yeah, exactly. Y- you can never get. And it. the other thing is like, you know, like I said, like this is sort of like the seminal post punk like record. And so like this record, like, or I mean this band like means so much to me because like, um, uh, post punk is like one of, if not my favorite genre of, of like music to, to discover and listen to and everything. So like, you know, the, this was the keys to that kingdom, you know? So it's like, I, yeah. Because of that, you know, it, it like always will have like such a, uh, you know, important place in, in, in my, my heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> heart and soul. I guess mm, for me, it's like, for me, I have this kind of like, you know, I feel like this distant appreciation for it now. Like I can sort of remember, you know, relating to, to the lyrics and stuff like that when I was younger, I can like remember it. But for the most part, I listened to this, you know, I was listening to it for the first time in a while and it's like. I'm like kind of distantly, um, you know, just not like getting into the lyrics or digging them or whatever, but just like, you know, appreciating like the imagery and the poetry and stuff, trying to forget about the suicide and all the like grand mythology. Um, but I did have some success, like appreciating the arrangements, like I was talking about, you know, I guess Dan, you've been listening to it 
you know, more consistently than I have, but it is weird to kind of like go back to it. Right. And, and appreciate the things that it like went on to influence and where it comes from and stuff that you didn't realize before. You know what I mean? Cause when I was first listening to this, I didn't know what no wave was, you know? And now it's like listening back through that lens. I'm like, damn, like they're like inventing, you know, like the kind of sounds that were about to like emerge and change everything. You know what I mean? Or like heart and soul is like almost a, like a minimal techno song. It's like the first, you know, it's like, it's, it's pretty like minimal electronic, like r- repetitive kind of piece. And you know what I mean? Damn, yeah, of course. I mean, now. that, that, that's like, w- s- kind of like what I was saying, you know, like I, I now, uh, as I got older and stuff, have like this big appreciation for post-punk uh, and no wave, uh, you know, just so much stuff that's been inspired by this, you know, like this is so important, um, because it, it, it opened all those doors and, and it is, it, I, I enjoy like, you know, looking at stuff that, that influenced other things, you know, like all that's, uh, you know, super interesting to me. And, you know, it's, uh, I think that you know that that I I don't have such like a distant appreciation for it like like you're saying you know it, it, it's like like I still just like legitimately like the record and everything um right, right. you know but but yeah I mean that's definitely like I think that's why my appreciation has has lasted you know because yeah as I'm older now like the 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 moodiness of it isn't like as appealing and you know like like Darren was saying like when you're young you know we would always like you know joke about i mean it, it sounds bad to say it now but like you know you joke and be like you know you think it's so cool that he killed himself when he's 23 and all you know all well, this you stuff would, like yeah that. you would idolize yeah yeah exactly I mean, that's, I, yeah that's I was what i gonna was. say yeah it, it becomes like a, an idealization kind of thing it just like you know you, you make these two fantastic records and you know you're out you know that, that just had like such like a a, a cool quality like as as a as a kid whereas like now as an adult it just like is incredibly sad that that you know he died at 23 you know it it, like it takes on a different meaning when you're like much older than that you know now i know some of the lyrics are like are really yeah they just like hit me like way different now you know when he says stuff like i'm ashamed of the person i am you know like talking to his mom or whatever Mm -hmm. it's like shit hurts me but um You know, I just was struck, right, listening for the first time in a while that, like, recognizing all of the influence they've had didn't make it sound, like, less new, but more new somehow, because I was like, damn, I cannot believe this existed, you know what I mean, like, in 1980, that this album came out i mean yeah it isn't something you think of like 1980 or i mean and most of it was like uh made in in the you know 79 or whatever you know yeah it's just incredible because i think it like almost it almost like predicts the entire 80s and speaking of which you know i want to start talking about like some highlights and stuff and i found isolation to hold up really well personally um it's a lot brighter you know maybe that's why but it's like it's like the brightest like poppiest most genuinely catchy song here i think um but you know it's basically like a new wave song before new wave exists and the and yet it's like it's still like very creative with the production choices and you know i, I wanted to you know we've been talking about it but like specifically shout out like martin hannett's production on this record is like so celebrated um and you know I, i've read that he would do things like to to really create even more empty space and really emphasize this mechanical aspect he would have like Stephen morris the drummer record every drum separately mm-hmm. you know like one at a time hmm. and i think you can really hear it on isolation it's like it should be like a rocking punk track punk track right and if you listen to like live versions it is um and that's true of a lot of their music but when you listen to it here the drums are layered in such a strange way and mixed in such a strange way um they all sound isolated if you hey. will um <laughs> And uh, that's where a drum roll would would come in. Um, <laughs> but you know, and 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 it's got like these like these synths. They really do sound like static electricity, just like blasting out. And yet, it's got this cool primitive punk spirit. Um, you know, I wonder, Darren, were there some songs that jumped out of you that actually did work for you here? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Isolation is obviously a good example. Um, you know, I actually really appreciated uh 24 hours i don't even know if we've even mentioned that um that like baseline the um for me like almost like describes the entire album like just the mood of the entire album um 
you know, I, I feel like it, it really picks up. It's a real driving type of song, too, yeah, at the is. same time. But it also slows down. It kind of encapsulates yeah, it, a lot about the interesting album. Interesting how it's like, it's like, there are never choruses on this whole album. It's like just verses and stuff. But it's like, if you could call it a chorus, the chorus is like the slow part, right? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. When it drops really, down half yeah. speed. And then for some reason, it like speeds up for the verses. And you're like rushing towards something. And then it just all kind of like drops down. And that's like the second half of the record where it gets like very gets very lush and the guitars are like making these kind of like droning swells instead right. of screeching a brace which i think noise. is um, is where i i think i gravitate a bit more towards um we've talked about decades a bit but i i think that's the best song on the album um mm. kind of w- was one that i was constantly looking forward to um and then upset at the end because it jumps to like a, a concert or <laughs> a live show like right afterwards oh, yeah. it's very jarring yeah. <laughs> but um but yeah, I, I just think that that song is gorgeous decades. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what are your highlights, Dan? Yeah, I, I like love Colony. I think that's my favorite track on here. It's just interesting. It's just like the most like this one's barely held together. It's the most like sort of no wavy right. like it's 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 kind of the, the, the craziest one here. Um, yeah, he's just shouting. Yeah, Usually yeah, he's yeah. Like very, on this album in particular, he's like quite subdued. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, if, yep. if, it's weird if you listen back to Unknown Pleasures, his voice is like oh, almost always in like a higher register. And you would think like, you know, it was at the beginning of their career versus the end when he's like calmed down and his voice is dropped down. <laughs> octave, but it was just like one one year difference. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> Yeah, I just love like that 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 build up, you know, like uh at the at the end when he like sort of like, you know, really starts yelling and all. I, like I love that. Uh yeah. I mean, I also I think the Atrocity Exhibition is like such a good opener. You know, just that like those opening notes with that tom roll and that that guitar screech we keep talking about, like that just you know, pulls pulls me in personally. Like I, I, I just think that's such a like perfect uh, entrance into like this this world of of this album yeah. uh, and the production in in particular. Like I, I think like you you can't understate the production on this record. You know, you know Martin Hanna, he's our he's our fifth Beatle here. Um, <laughs> right. Like so much so, I I think we should talk about. I don't think we mentioned it. Like the band actually like didn't like the production. Um, yeah why do you think that is i i think it's like you know darren mentioned that like you know on spotify and stuff there's like a live show attached to this now um right and if you listen to any like sort of live joy division they almost sound like a different band like the, 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 this punk thing is like much more um apparent you know like they sound more yeah, like definitely. a uh, they sound more like a, a a band in a garage uh you know it it's some of the things that like you know i we we've talked about like why i love this record so much and all like really uh, you can attribute just just to martin you know i mean the, the this atmosphere and this emptiness and all like is not really i think what the band like really wanted you know uh they they hate yeah. the production on unknown pleasures like uh also um but it's like I, I read like a little thing. I, I don't remember the exact story, but basically like they were recording a song and like they're playing it back and, uh, you know, Peter Hook goes in and he tells like Martin, like, you know, don't fuck this. Guy. I don't want another unknown pleasures. Like, <laughs> and uh, Hannah told him like, get the fuck out of here. I'm not listening to <laughs> and, you know, that's like the great, you know, it's like so good that he did that, you know? Um, yeah. Cause I, and it's, it's interesting, right? Because like, if you listen to atrocity exhibition, right, what, what I can hear and then, you know, if you listen to live versions, you get this impression, but it's like, you can actually hear on the record that the guitar, which Peter Hook played guitar on that track, um, oddly, uh, you know, what he was going for was like creating a huge noisy mess. And instead Martin Hannett has like made it sound really far away and mm-hmm. like really weak and everything and it like is just you know just this like noise in the back of your head kind of that barely yeah, and i makes think it, it just has like s- it has so much more impact that way you know if it was just like yeah a, it does a, it, which is strange like to think about but if it was just like a big wall of sound in your face you know it would drown out like the the other aspects of the song uh that 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 give it this atmosphere this feeling and and i think like so much of it would be lost so much so that like you know i i, I said in the beginning like i i used to love like listening to joy division like live bootlegs and stuff that's like something i honestly don't like recommend like they're really a much better studio band um yeah than a, than a live band you know um the 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 
if you want to hear like i think like what they would sound like uh if if they produced it themselves or something you know like on, on like that substance collection you know there's there's like those original uh warsaw tracks when that you know before they had changed their name to Joy right, division right. and they sound i mean ian's voice sounds way different but like the just the music you know like it sounds like a punk band and i i think like if they had stuck with that and like these like unknown pleasures and and uh this record had like turned out that way i I think they would be like a band that like, you know, it was a cool punk band you find, but you know, whatever they wouldn't have this like, um, immense like following and, and, and love and everything that, that they get, you know, they definitely, I don't think it would have like started this like, you know, goth post-punk like sort of movement. No, because it it, like explodes everything because Mm -hmm. it just like, you know, it's easy to lose appreciation of it now, but it just like radically upends like what rock is supposed to be, you know, it like, to even call this rock feels weird um, because it's like the, you know, like I said, the bass is like the central instrument, the bass and the drums and the drums are often like, you know, they don't just keep a beat. They're like very stuttery and like mm-hmm. strange. The bass is like playing the melody, like usually quite high, you know, it's just like completely not what rock is supposed to do. And, you know, it seems to draw on influences like, you know, dub music. We talked about that a lot with, with Fishman's where it's like very bass heavy and like more like empty space emphasizing, um, you know, even draws on dance music and stuff like that. I mean, it's like, it just feels like this kind of stuff was unheard of at the time. And now it feels so natural to like jump between these genres and stuff, but it's, it was really very inventive. Um, I did want to mention, you know, like (laughs) I just remember for some reason, like listening to this album, um, in high school and really struggling with the song Colony. I think it's like the hardest song here. Um, but, you know, as I was in those days, I was basically like determined to make myself love it. <laughs> so I would just listen to it like over and over and over again until I loved it. Um, but it is like, you know, it feels like Atrocity Exhibition's like Little Brother or something. And yet it's like even less of a song. Um, <laughs> you know, I wonder just out of curiosity, Darren, did you find Colony like pretty difficult or were there other songs that were like, you just could not get into it all. Colony was one I wasn't really um, huge on. Um, you know, it kind of has like, uh, I kept trying to think of like, what was it reminding me of? And I think it kind of reminds me of Nirvana's Bleach a little bit. Um, mm, my favorite kind of chugging... Nirvana record, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. It, it's just got kind of like that bit of that chug um, punk punk style or whatever. but. Uh, the guitar, the guitar also, on it, just kind of what the you know, the the little like. Well, melodies. it reminds me of like uh, like the guitar on Scentless Apprentice feels like taken directly from yeah. this album. You know what I mean? Like how screeching yeah, and like yeah, yeah. you know, there it's like Kurt is deliberately trying to send like a fuck you to people who liked you know smells like Teen Spirit or whatever. It's like just so you know you know like remember learning that song, um, Scentless Apprentice, and playing it with our band, you know, and it's like. <laughs> of course. It's like, what is this guitar riff? It's just like, <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> yeah, it's just like open. It's like the shittiest one, thing you two, can ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's like not even a written riff or anything. It's just yeah. like it's pretty much just noise. And there's a lot of that on this album. Um, you know, I, I did also want to talk a little bit about genre. Like, without getting too much into it, we, we've touched on like how this, you know, sort of invents po- post punk. I know that like some people, you know, some like snobs would probably object to that, but um, it's not like it comes out of nowhere. But like. I am pretty curious about like, you know, I I mentioned how rock does not feel right at all to describe this, but like what, you know, what is the genre? Like it it feels like, doesn't it often feel like dance music? And yet doesn't it feel like impossible (laughs) that you could describe this as dance music? (laughs) Sometimes it's like very, it's like there's sometimes no melody at all. And yet it's very catchy. Like I think I mentioned isolation is like a pure pop song. Like what is this? I I think it's, it is sort of dancey, and I think it's like you said, like, there is this dub influence. Like, I remember in, like, Peter Hook's book, like, uh, he talked about, like, um, I can't remember if it was the whole band or just him or, or some of them, where they they would go to, like, this one dub club that was, like, uh, you know, real big in, in London or Manchester, wherever they were at the time. And, like, you know, the band, like, just loved it and would, would go all the time and stuff and, and really were influenced by it. So I think, like, you know, that's definitely, like, a intentional, uh, you know, feel to it. Um, And I mean, dub is essentially dance music, but again, is like a sort of, you you feel a little strange, like, like calling it that, you know, because like of that emptiness, you know, I I think like when you think of like, you know, 
you know, when you just think dance music, you don't really think of like emptiness, but I think you do if you, if, you know, if you, if you boil that down to, to dub and everything. Um, but there's also, I mean, yeah, there's definitely these elements of like pop in there, you know, like isolation as, as weird as, as it seems like is like sort of a, you know, a poppy song, you know, I, isolation, like sort of like reminds me like of Montreal, like, uh, you know, like hissing fauna, um, uh, especially like the, the big single from it, like Hindle's gate, like a Promethean curse. Like he, um, you know, he's like singing these like very sad, like lyrics, but it's like a really like upbeat sounding song and like yeah. isolation, like sort of ha- like, I, I, I sort of wonder like, is that song, uh, like directly inspired by, um, joy division and, and maybe even in particular isolation like it, it, it's it's a song like the the lyrics and the 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 theme of it you know are isolation but it, it is like sort of the like happiest poppiest you know track here you know as yeah, close as we yeah. get to that you know uh, on this record it, it does it creates a very interesting dynamic and maybe it's like you know cliche now to say like dark lyrics on top of happy song but it's like i, yeah. I think that would have been like Pretty yeah, I can't think of like anything uh, like that, that that precedes that track, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I, I want to sort of like jump ahead a little bit because I do want to talk about some big picture stuff, but I guess I get the picture, but, you know, how did it go <laughs> trying to get into this? Like, how would you rate your success, Darren? I would say, you know, the needle hasn't really moved for me. Wow. Um, but we again, failed. you know, I don't, I don't really come from a place where I've, you know, where I ever hated Joy Division. I just never really got into it. And at this point, I, I do feel like maybe the boat has sailed and I've missed whatever chance I may have had. And now I'm just kind of left with an appreciation, but certainly not, you know, eager to want to listen to unknown pleasures or anything like that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean like I kind of said already, it's like it had been a long time since I listened to this and I did worry that like, it would just be intolerable, like yeah. just completely like brooding and just, you know, moody and that I wouldn't get anything out of it. And like I said, I found like the, you know, the music side of things like really, um, impressive, you know, in a way, but I wonder, um, you know, Dan, do you think in retrospect, we should have made him listen to like unknown pleasures or even substance, you know, the singles kind of collection? Uh, you know, not, not substance. I, I, it, you know, obviously like there's really good songs on there, but you know, it, it's not like a collective, you know, piece of art, you know, you, you have all those Warsaw demos, which are really like, if, unless you're like a big fan, you don't like really like need to hear those or anything, you know? Um, but yeah. I, I don't I don't think he would have done any better with unknown pleasures. Um, I, I I think I think honestly, like you know, the the, the ship has sort of sailed. Like I, I think if you if you <laughs> if you've not like if you, if you've missed the headspace of it, I, I I think it would be difficult to like in your thirties like uh, discover that <laughs> and 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 uh, I think you can you can appreciate it, which it seems like Darren does. You know, like like he said, he like, doesn't think it's a bad record. It's just not like something that's moving him. And I think that that that's sort of like what you're gonna get if you if you come into it this late. Um, so really, that that doesn't like really shock me or, or or surprise me. And and I don't think that Unknown Pleasures would have been uh, any more or really even uh, any less successful. Yeah, and I you know I, I do want to like mention that like I'm not trying to suggest that like with with my extra years or there's some sort of maturity level that I've reached, you know, cause I, I could certainly see people with different lives getting into this headspace in their yeah, mid- yeah. 20s, 30s, 40s, 40s, whatever. Like, it's just kind of, it just depends on who you are, the sort of, you know, life you've lived and stuff and what, what moves you, you know, moody yeah. music doesn't really move me anymore unless it's something that I, I used to listen to and I get nostalgic about it. That's, that's pretty much it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing I forgot to ask, actually, which is, like, on the topic of moodiness, you know, I did find, re-listening now, that, like, what I, my favorite thing about this album was, like, the trio of songs at the end, where it's basically, like, three closing songs, Mm -hmm. you know, like, 24 Hours, uh, The Eternal, and Decades, like, each one tops the last in epic closing trackness, and, (laughs) um, you know, I found now that, like, it was a little bit like too bleak you know that as much as i love the arrangements and everything i think they're like absolutely brilliant what they're doing with their very limited equipment and you know and and everything um did you guys have that same experience did you find that like 
you know, it was like a little much at the end there. A little bit, you know, uh, I did, I think I mentioned that I was like looking forward to decades as I was getting through the end of the album. And that was largely because through the eternal, I was kind of like, all right, you know, am I at decades yet? Like when, when is decades coming up? You know, this is when I wasn't really paying attention to the tracks or anything, but just kind of recognizing things as I went along. Um, so 24 hours, like you're, you're absolutely right. Those last three tracks really set you into a pretty long what like uh 16 minutes maybe more of just dread yeah. you know what i mean um <laughs> yeah i think i i really love 24 hours i mentioned that and i really love decades but the 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 middle piece the eternal i think is a bit much yeah i mean can you at least admit dan that it's a little a little too bleak maybe there yeah i mean i'm if, if there's gonna be any you know it doesn't really bother me but i i think if there's gonna be any uh you know thing you can point at and say like you know we're getting a little too goth here you know like you know that that trio uh <laughs> would be it yeah yeah well you know i want to start talking about like the band as a whole and their legacy which i think is really interesting um but you know i i did have some thoughts like what if we should have done unknown pleasures what if we should have done substance even because you know the thing that you mentioned that that's really you know one of the most fun things about joy division is when they are mixing the kind of like dance music the like you know happier poppier sounding thing with like the very bleakness of the lyrics and the even the production sounds like sterile and like dead inside you know but the like mixture is very very cool and i do think you get a lot more of that on like um unknown pleasures and substance and there's something like kind of there's something fun and exciting about that, you know. Like I think about like when we would go to um, we would go to like this club, uh, shout out the castle, um, <laughs> where they would have these kind of like what what would they call it like new wave night or something? Yeah, it was uh, it was called top and new wave night, and and like uh, yeah, and it was two floors, and and the top one was like pop music, and then bottom outside was a uh, you know new wavey kind of thing. But their definition of new wave was goth shit, and they would you know play yeah. Joy Division and all that. <laughs> Yeah, but I remember like it was like shockingly fun as hell. Yeah, no, to yeah, dance. it was. So, so, like, I used, I think that was on uh, Thursday nights, and yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I went every Thursday for a couple years. <laughs> but like dancing <laughs> to like something like Love Will Tear Us Apart or something like I never. Oh yeah, they would play that. Actually, every, you know, every week. Yeah, it, definitely. It was really, really fun. Honestly, um, so you know, I kind of wondered like if if that would do it, but you know, the the question I have here is like why does joy division have like the legacy that they do i I find it actually incredibly perplexing okay because you know they have this like you know they're known for their darkness and stuff they do have like the fun like their songs that i just don't i just don't think like i said that i would think of them as fun until i happened to be dancing to it and i was like this is actually fun you know like (laughs) i thought the dance 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 to the radio thing was like a joke but it actually is really fun to dance to the song um you know, like, why are they so well known? They don't have like radio hits, really. You know what I mean? Is it because New Order got so famous? You know, is it like because of that, like people discovered, you know, Joy Division? Um, I like honestly don't, don't know. you know, really like, no, because yeah, it is like so strange that they're they are famous. I mean, obviously, like these are these two are great records. I think even if New Order never existed, like they would be, um, yeah. you know, very you know popular in in like the music you know circles um but like it is a little strange that they're like more you know like they, they've made it out of that like you know, captain beefheart level where it's like you know if you like music you know about it but like your yeah. mom doesn't and, and you know or something and they're like a rite of passage band like for everybody that gets you know seriously into music um except for darren who skipped decided to skip it. <laughs> um, but like i mean you 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 recognize darren right that they are like they seem like so like you know, just inappropriately famous. Sure. You know I mean? like, how do you explain this? Well, yeah. And I mean, I mentioned at the top that I've always had um, closer on my iPod back in the day, obviously, because, you know, if somebody happened to catch me and, and go through my music library, if I didn't have Joy Division, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, who am I? <laughs> you know, that's, that's the perception, right? right? Similar to like the Smiths, uh, you know, yeah, and Nirvana, whatever. Like, you, you know, there are definitely like these like, pillars in music um right. that you feel like you just have and that's why i've just kind of always felt like I-, I gotta try it gotta try it now i consider it a blunder um and it's too bad but um <laughs> how or why i mean 
I, I don't know. You know, I think it, it is a bit unfortunate based on what you were sort of saying, Gabe, but I, I do think that Ian Curtis's suicide has, you know, a lot to, to do with this sort of fame. You know what I mean? I, I think that it draws a lot of attention to people um, who listen to music. I think having a short, but really, you know, yeah. incredible, uh, you know, just two albums, you know, what a career. Yeah. I think draws a lot of attention as well historically. You know what this, I mean? Yeah, they don't. They like have. They have no bands. way to like tarnish that. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're like one of those rare bands that has just basically two perfect albums, mm-hmm. and then you also literally have to get the all the singles. You know, like you just have to because it's an incomplete picture. And you know, the Smiths are that way too, where it's like, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. They, they inspire mm-hmm. this like obsessiveness. You got to get everything, um, and it's not overwhelming to do so. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. I mean, I think that. Maybe, you know, can I propose the idea? I wonder what you guys think. Like, is it sometimes just random? Like, basically for somebody like me, when I was in, you know, ninth grade or whatever, when I got this this album, um, it was like the most experimental thing I had ever heard, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I still find it pretty inventive um, and pretty crazy that it ever, even exists. Um, and it's still, even though like it inspired so much and like post-punk became like really a, de- a defining genre of like what we would call indie music or whatever um you know it still kind of sounds like nothing else like you know it's just like if something sounds like this it's quote sounds like joy division you know um that's why i saw you know on the cover of like that magazine that like is interpol just a joy division ripoff you know um so you know it's just like my question is does the world just randomly like does society just pick like a random pretty experimental band to make like everybody's first experimental band you know like could it have been somebody else like could it have been gang of four that is in this are spot you, or something could it have been wire are you saying joy division is an industry plant <laughs> <laughs> oh i mean i God. think I, I you know i think like you know i joke about the industry plant thing I, I you don't mean like you know somebody decided like we're gonna make joy division the one like i i think it just like the the zeitgeist like sort of just for whatever yeah, reason yeah, like that's what I mean. you know it's a it's a good it, you know the records are good but but yeah i mean you could argue i mean i love gang of four like you know i think entertainment is like almost as great of a record as as unknown pleasures or anything but but yeah they're sort of like a band you discover you know after you got into joy division or whatever yeah. you know like yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just like, I, I mean, that's why I think like so much is because like, because New Order like has huge hits, you know, because like then, you know, people, one, it's like easier to get someone to listen to it. You know, you're like, hey, you should check this out. You like New Order. This is their, you know, this used to be the band or but whatever. Who, I mean, but does where is anybody like, listen to New Order before Joy Division? Like who? I mean, I think you're th- you're thinking like people like us that are doing a music podcast. I think you're normal I mean, person. I I, yeah, like I mean, I think I don't think so. I think people like us are like like everybody on Read Your Music is people just like us. You know? Yeah, like, no, exactly. But I mean, I'm talking about like people, the general populace. You know, like obviously, like all of those people went through probably Joy Division like at, at the same time that you and I did, Dan and. It led them on to all these interesting things. Yeah, because when like, you're when you're a teenager, I don't think you get into like, you know, like there's always this like sort of like stigma uh, about like new wave kind of music at first, you know, like people like associate with like Flock of Seagulls and, and stuff like that, you know, but then when you discover like, oh, there's actually really good stuff like New Order, you know, but, but I think it takes like a little bit to get past that like stigma. So for people like us and everything, I think it's much easier to find Joy Division first. I mean, like the reason like Joy Division is a band that like, people that aren't that into music like still kind of know i think like new order has a lot to do with it because maybe it's easier to say like oh new you know you, you have like an in when you know you know blue monday or, or whatever yeah i guess i, I just like I, I just find it so strange because like, i mean it's I definitely strange into, i don't you know don't get me wrong i mean it's not it's not like I, you know like basically when i was getting into joy division i told you like there was one copy in this enormous virgin megastore of just you know, this is the only album there, like in the little Joy Division area, like under J, you know, mm-hmm. was this album with a cracked case. I couldn't find Unknown Pleasures anywhere, you know, and I didn't just go to Best Buy. I went to like local record shop, you know, and stuff. Couldn't find it. And yet I get a little older and I find out 
fucking everybody went through the joy division phase at the same time as me you know here i thought i had found this like really obscure (laughs) gem you know couldn't believe it couldn't believe how incredible of a story they had and like why doesn't everybody talk about joy division all the time and then five years later their t-shirt is like such a joke Mm. that you can't wear it without being you know laughed out of the room basically um it, it's just it's just crazy that it has its status i mean do you think it's random at all darren or do you think like i mean maybe it is as simple as just like they have the sound and the story yeah and i i think timing has a lot to do with it you know i think um very similar to like nirvana i mean it for as great of a songwriter and a singer that kurt cobain you know that voice that he had i mean the timing was huge you know it was it was just the right you know aligning of of the planets whatever you want to call it right um even kurt didn't realize when he was writing smells like teen spirit that it was going to become what it was going to become he thought Mm -hmm. in bloom right he he thought this was the song whatever so he he didn't even have the finger his finger on the pulse right so you know that that kind of tells you that like hey this this stuff just happens at random and we just don't know what's what that's going to mean. So yeah, then, yeah, yeah. so, you know, this is night, that's 1991. We're also talking about like 1980, but yet here we are in like, what was it like 2004, 2003? You know what I mean? Is it just yeah. because like as a rite of passage, like you meant gave like, is everybody who hits that age of like 15, 16 and gets into music? Is that like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess like over the course of time, certain bands just sort of fill those slots, you know, and become like those pillars and any other band that follows just become, you know, supplementary artists that yeah. are good to get yeah. into afterwards. But they, they were first joy division was first. They became that pillar. Nirvana found that certain spot and became their own pillar. You know what I mean? All other bands after that are just following in the wake, yeah. you know? Yeah, that is a good way to put it. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm realizing just it's it's like, uh, you know, because we're like mentioning Nirvana so much. And I guess like basically Darren sort of epitomizes what I think a new listener to Joy Division must feel like, which is like, you know that there's like a Nirvana in there, but it's too late to like yeah. get in, into it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I that think like that's what all, I'm the feeling, myth- yeah. all the mythos and all the experience, but you're like going to be on the outside looking in. Um, yeah, kind of funny. Um Okay, so I think we covered a lot of these. We touched on a lot of the questions that I've got jotted down here. Um, maybe we can sort of like wrap up this conversation with, you know, what I think is like, I don't know. Everybody asks this question all the time, and I feel like we just have to ask it, even though I don't know how interesting it actually is. But like, what do you think would have happened, Dan, if like Ian didn't kill himself? Like, would, would, you know, we have just gotten all of the great New Order songs with Ian singing? Would that have been a cool thing? Um, would they have just stayed bleak and dark like the whole time? Like, what would have happened? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll never know, but I, I, I think the, the 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 one clue we sort of have is like the first New Order record, like Movement. You know, it, it's kind of different from uh, New Order, like what they become, um, and I think it's like it, it's sort of the bridge between Joy Division and New Order. Whereas, like, you know, I, it, it's hard to like really think of like Ian singing anything on you know like Technique or, or something or Power <laughs> Corruption and Lies, but like. I, I feel like movement you can like you can almost hear it and you know like the the, the last yeah. like joy division song that's like you know done released whatever is i love will tear us apart um and you know like love will tears apart like sort of seems like the bridge between um closer and you know right. movement and that you know like it and then like movement is sort of you know like the bridge into the later thing i i, I think they would have you know, sort of, sort of gone down that that sort of synthy path. Um, maybe not quite as like dancey um, uh, as like New Order gets, um, but I think I think we would have like like a, a movement style uh, New Order. Uh, it would have stuck there, and and that would have probably been it. Huh. Well, um, I wonder, Darren. It just occurred to me: is did you ever did New Order ever happen for you, or is that also a blunder? No, that would also be a blunder. My perception, wow. though, I'm pretty sure I've listened to a bit, though. It's, it's like, super different, right? It's, like, much brighter, much dancier. It's not, yeah, It's yeah. really nothing like Joy Division, or is that? am I wrong? Maybe now that you've done this, you would be able to hear it. I think you, you can definitely, like, hear it. Yeah, there, there's, um, but... there's, there's spots of it there, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's different, yeah. The singing always stays kind of, like, Ian Curtis-ish, you know? Okay. It's not, like... 
it's not like Peter Hook was secretly like this great, you know, singer, uh, you know, hiding in the background. It's like they still kind of sing in an amateurish, like kind of jaggedy way. But uh, yeah, it does get like much more creative with the like dance music and brighter and everything. Um, but I, I feel I kind of feel like we should definitely one day do a, an episode on New New Order. Yeah, I'd be in on that. Well, any uh, final thoughts or do we have some time for a couple of listener emails? Let's go for it. So we recently received a wonderfully long and detailed email from Jerry, who had a number of interesting thoughts on our Fishman's discussion uh, last time. In particular, he mentioned Talk Talk as the perfect analogy for Fishman's creative 180, as he said, with long season. I do think that's a great comparison. I think I mentioned like Scott Walker during the episode, and that doesn't really work right at all. But Talk Talk is actually like the perfect comparison. Um but he, he also asks us, you know, what other albums might have like a Talk Talk or Fishman's-esque like rise to critical prominence. I didn't know this, but he mentioned that, um, you know, I haven't fact-checked it, but that Talk Talk just wasn't as respected until like Tom York started, started name-dropping them. Um, and then now they're like obviously, you know, huge, huge classics. Um, I think that could make for a good like entire episode sometimes in the future. But he also asks a, a bunch of like great smaller questions that I want to kind of sprinkle into future episodes so we can get to them all. Um, there were two that I thought were particularly relevant to our Joy Division conversation. The first one, do you think people nowadays are more aware of music in general? Do you feel that the accessibility and ease of consuming music journalism and obscure music has helped people of current generations to have quote, better taste than people before? I put be- better taste in quotes because taste is subjective, but you know what I mean? Um, I do know what you mean. And, you know, this kind of gets right to it, right? Like Joy Division was that is was that band for mm-hmm. so many people, right? Like that band that leads you somewhere else, um, leads you on to greater things. I mean, do you think they'll like, they'll be able to keep that, you know, status? Like as that pillar you were mentioning, Darren, because now it's true. Like the most obscure music is just as easily reachable. You know, it's a click away, just like Led Zeppelin is or whatever. You know, you don't have to go through Joy Division if you don't want, you know, it, it, what do you think about that question? I think that people will still go through Joy Division for the simple fact that, like, you still have to have, like, heard of it. Just because you can also find, you know, uh, boredoms on, on Spotify um, right. doesn't mean you're, you're going you're gonna to skip Joy Division and, and, and go straight there because you didn't hear about it, you know? Um, I, I think, like, um, it does lead to, like, better taste, like he said, you know, whatever, subjective. But, um, you know, like like, when I was a kid... Uh, you, you had to go to Best Buy. You had to just like pick a random ass right. CD, you know, half the time that you didn't know. I mean, when I was like in middle school, I, I fucking listened to corn, you know, like because that was what was on the radio and, you know, it seemed cool and I didn't know anything else, you know, like I didn't know Joy, <laughs> right. you know, I didn't know Joy Division exists. I know, like you said, you know, you couldn't, they didn't even sell it at Best Buy. You know, if I had heard of it, I couldn't get it, you know, that you couldn't order a CD off the internet, you know, back then, at least not easily, um, you know, not as a, a 12 year old or, or anything, you know, the, there was a local, two local record stores where I live and I would go there. Um, but even they, you know, had pretty limited selection, um, you know, like the, the you know, you couldn't find anything like really, you know, they probably didn't have gang of four records or, or, or wire or right, talk right. talk or anything, you know, um, you know, so you like you, you you sort of had to go through these like shitty bands at that time because like you had to get into like what basically like, you had access to like MTV and you know whatever radio stations you, you had in your area. So it's like if you didn't hear of something there, um, you know where where were you going to hear about it? You know where were you even going to find it if you did hear about it? But so then, like, so then, why does that mean that people are are still going to go through? Joy- well, well, because Joy- I think what do you think? I, I think because like. Um, you know, you, you, they're such a famous band, you know, you see the t-shirts, you, you, you just, people talk about them, you know I mean? They still talk about them on, on pitchfork and stuff, you know, every now and then. And so I think it's just like, they're such a, you know, it's, it's like a Led Zeppelin, uh, you know, almost for, for like indie music, you know, it's like, why do people find Led Zeppelin? It's because, you know, everybody like talks about it. Everybody like sort of knows about it. And so I think like Joy Division being like one of those pillars will like remain one of those pillars, um, but I think it's easier to find those pillars, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about that, Darren? I mean, I think I I think it's difficult, right? Um, I think in this day and age, it's it's it seems like it's so much easier to just miss Joy Division altogether. You know, um, I think about your younger brother, Gabe, like while we were going through our music phases and stuff, and he was a couple years younger, but 
you know, it always seemed like you were able to just kind of guide him. Like you were able to provide <laughs> right. exactly what he needed to, to do. Whereas before we were just kind of like going into Best Buy and finding this random album and then hearing about, you know, looking I stuff know. up. That, that doesn't seem to really exist anymore. You know, that idea of like going off and searching in a store or a record store and finding it at a young age, you know, just doesn't seem to happen because you have Spotify and you have Apple Music or whatever. You really need some sort of guide or someone to kind of tell you like, hey, you, you know, you can't miss Joy Division. Like now's the time. If you, if you don't get it now, you will miss out on it. You know what I mean? Like. And I think that Pitchfork used to be that. That was kind of like what we used in a lot of ways. You know, I think yeah. right, your music still can be that for people. But again, like, I don't know. You know, you guys, I, ha- I have a an older son who's who's kind of getting closer and closer to the age where I was really getting into music and stuff. And like, I don't know his everyday friends or the cliques that are going on in school these days. I have no idea. But I do feel this perception of like, there's not a a great deal of interest of like discovering great music of the past. It's like, what can I just immediately um, digest yeah. right now, you know, and that all my friends are yeah. listening to kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, yeah, because it's more of like the same thing happened with us, but it was just like our circles. What were our circles True. listening to specifically? Right. Um, and here we are still but, hanging out. You know, yeah, no, because... no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Still strong. <laughs> No, it is true. I, 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 it's funny you mentioned that because I, I used to, you know, think about like I really resented my little brother because <laughs> he got to like skip it. You know what yeah, I mean? Like he's like yeah. he's he's like fucking like twelve years old listening to Slint, and I'm like, you know how hard I had to work to find <laughs> no, Slint. I know, I know, yeah, exactly. Like, Jesus Christ, you know. Um, so I, I definitely hated him for that. Um, I do think though that like we're living in something like a, a weird transitional time. Is my yeah. sort of opinion on this? Is like basically i think rate your music is gonna like kind of you know it's gonna become that like dominant thing yeah right? it has already and it's like kind of being established as like the place where the young music obsessives like us are gonna they're gonna find rate your music and they're gonna be there for a long time because they're gonna work their way through like the top 500 you know and like that's how they're gonna get into things and and yet right now the top 500 is made by people like us who have already discovered it all you know the hard way Mm -hmm. um the old style and so you've got stuff like pink floyd's dark side of the moon is like the number two rated record of all time on rate your music and it's like will it it's just because we all like went through the pink floyd phase right yeah and the question is will that hold right because as more and more people you know let's say like let's say imagine rate your music lasts forever or something similar as the next generation sort of comes through they might just not have the pink floyd bug you know that we all got right and they might just be like fuck pink floyd and it might just fall right out of the top 500 and just not really be part of like the canon anymore and then it's like you know i just feel like we live in an age where it's like seriously those pillars which felt to us like they were going to be there forever actually might not be right Right. you know what i'm saying yeah and i can i you know i I can see that with certain things i mean especially when you say like dark side of the moon like you know that that's a record yeah i found when i was younger and i liked it at the time and everything but like once i like grew up and like found other things like i really like like now i think that record's actually really shitty you know and and everything like (laughs) i I, and maybe it's just me because i still like joy division or whatever but i i feel like joy division isn't like that sort of thing i think people like will still find it and still enjoy it whereas like pink floyd like dark side of the moon it, it it just sort of seems like you know when you've never heard any sort of experimental music because th- that was the most experimental thing you could buy at Best Buy was Dark Side of the Moon. Like, you know, it, it kind of blows your mind. But then once you find out, like, about other things, it, it becomes like, oh, that's just like a dad rock record that they, like, put a couple, you know, they had a janitor talk, <laughs> you know, for a second or, or whatever, you know, put a little <laughs> trippy effect on it, you know, and it, like, sort of, it, like, sort of, like, what's cool about it, like, sort of, like, loses its luster. I don't think like yeah. things like like Joy Division and I mean like the Beatles, you know, uh, even Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy stuff like stuff like that I think will like hold um will they hold forever? Like probably not at all. I don't know if anything can, you know. I mean maybe they will, you know, maybe it'll become like 
you know, like a Beethoven sort of thing where it's like, oh, kids don't listen right, to it. Right. But, you know, it's like, a, a, you know, respected thing, you know, whatever. Um, but I, I, I think there's certain things that will sort of hold, you know, Led Zeppelin. I think Led Zeppelin will like is still a pillar and I think will remain a pillar because it's like it's still like, you know, those are still great records, you know, even, you know, like when I was a kid and I found them like you know it was like way awesome you know i hadn't heard anything like it and now that i'm like oh you know like everybody loves those but it's like yeah you know there's still great records you know the beatles are sort of like that um you know there's certain yeah. thing I, I i think it will shift but i don't think like everything will like completely change well yeah i mean so we're kind of like stepping on his second question which i should just go ahead and read um he says do you think the canon of best ever albums is firmly established or do you think it is in constant flux and a revision due to new forms of media changing the way we interact with past music 20 years ago everyone considered pink floyd's dark side of the moon to be one of the greatest ever but now hardly anyone still holds that opinion that's maybe debatable i, I really honestly don't know um it's still the number two record on regular music um he says do you think we will do the same with current classics like okay computer or even my beautiful dark twisted fantasy um so yeah, we've kind of been like addressing this, but you know, what are your thoughts about the the canon, Darren? Like, my feeling is that we're like on the cusp of radical upheaval of the canon, to be quite honest. But what do you think? I mean, I think so. Everything that Dan described about Dark Side of the Moon, I mean, I you know agree in some ways that like yes, I it was an album that I was really really into, but now. I wouldn't even think to recommend it because I feel like there's so many other better records that somebody could get into, you know what I mean? And I think that that, yeah. you know, that's, that's a clear shift from, you know, 15 years ago or whatever. Right. Um, there are other, certainly other albums that are like that, though. I do agree that there are some pillars that I st think still hold strong. Zeppelin, I think Nirvana is still very much a pillar. You know what I mean? Um, I agree. You know, I, I I think Radiohead is a pillar. The Beatles, all of these things are like, these are like the juggernauts that I feel like you start with. And then pretty much after that, you know, it's a bit more open than I feel like it was for us. You know, for us, it, it felt almost like a linear path where you go from one band to the band that influenced them to the band that influenced them yeah. kind of thing. Whereas now it's, it's just a bit wider. So I, I do think that the canon is going to shift quite a bit, but I... I I do expect to see some of these to still remain in place. Yeah. I, I guess I suspect that some of them will, but you know, I mean like in the, in a broader sense, like even beyond questions of technology, it's like every generation, like basically attacks the canon. you know, like yeah. when I was, when I was growing up, right. Like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd and stuff were like, you know, really, really transformative for me. But then as I kind of like, you know, grew into like the world of indie, like the pitchfork world, you know, that stuff was like dad rock. That was like as sure. uncool as it gets. Yeah. And so I really like moved away from it for a long time. And it was basically because, you know, like the indie generation was really, you know, it was just like, a, you know, totally opposed to everything that like Led Zeppelin represents. And, um, you know, so they were like, fuck Led Zeppelin, you know, like whatever, like Sonic Youth is the real, you know, the real deal or whatever, you know, and it's like, um, Every generation is going to do that. And in a weird way, people like generations are often, I don't know. It's just like the, the, the folly of youth. It's just like, whatever is cool right now, like, fuck that. You know what I mean? It, it like always seems to happen that way. So it's like, and like, whatever's uncool, let, you know, let's make it cool. So like, I, I just, I always assume that like, whatever is like the least cool thing right now, like, I don't know, like yacht rock and stuff like that's going to be cool soon because the new generation is going to be like everybody thinks this is lame but actually yeah really interesting and it's really cool <laughs> i you know? agree and I, i've talked about it a bunch you know like new metal is gonna make a comeback and and i think <laughs> it like it definitely is you know and it's because like yeah like like i i mentioned like you know that was big when i was in middle school you know sort of because lack of options you know i was into it and stuff but now you look back and it's like really embarrassing and, and bad and stuff but but yeah like I mean, when I was a kid, like, you know, my dad loved Led Zeppelin and stuff. And it was like, oh, you know, that's not cool. You know, that's that's old people music or whatever. But then, like, you grow up and you realize, like, oh, no, you know, Zeppelin actually is really good. Um, and I think that's just like, you know, th that is like youth. Like, you, you're always, like, rebelling against, like, what your parents like, you know? Like, I'm sure, Darren, like, <laughs> you, your kid, you know, like, 
probably doesn't like things like just because he knows you like them or something you know he probably fucking hates beethoven for sure <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean beethoven i think is a bit different just because it's I know, I'm it's just, just it's so far out there but but like certainly like nirvana has not been very moving so i so ne- then i was like all right well maybe weezer is more uh up to, more hip or whatever but now nah, it's I don't know. Yeah, I, and I've you tried, see, like, but it's... you know, when he's in his 20s or whatever, and it's not like, you know, because at his age and everything, like, it, it's a, a, big, a big part of it, like like you sort of mentioned, is, like, you know, what do your friends listen to? What's your, your like, exactly. circle? Because, like, it, there's a little bit of, like, you know you got to be cool by liking, you know, this thing, you know, there's a reason that like from a certain age, you know, almost everybody wears band t-shirts, you know, it's like, because like it becomes like your identity and like, uh, 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 like that is how you're, you know, quote unquote cool. You know, when you get a little older, you know, 20 or so, like, it, that doesn't really matter as much anymore and you kind of just start liking whatever you fucking actually like and, you know, yeah. it's fine. And so, you know, at, at that point, you know, I think, um, you know, he'll probably, yeah, I could see something like, like Weezer, you know, that, that could be like, uh, you know, a, a Zeppelin from, from us being kids or, uh, you know, Neutral Milk Hotel and, um, you know, plenty, plenty of things like that, you know, Joy Division even, you know, and stuff like, I, I could see that like, you know, the Yacht Rock thing, because I agree with you, Gabe, like Yacht Rock is like a thing that like, you know, people, so, you know, it always starts like ironically, they like it and then it just the it irony goes away yeah. but i don't think you know that's not gonna hold no one's gonna be like a oh, fucking you know, kenny loggins actually that is top 10 record I of all know. time like i don't i don't you know that, that that's sort of a a, a fad type well, maybe thing not, you know maybe not top 10 of all time yeah maybe it's a fad but you know it's just like there they're, i think there are things that like they seem really secure now and some things will pass into that realm like i really just don't think like the beatles are ever going to be dethroned or whatever, no but, there's no way yeah but you know like like radiohead right like they see their place seems very secure and yet i think that there will be a generation that will be like fuck radiohead you know just because yeah it's like i mean yeah do. exactly um, yeah so um yeah okay so i mean honestly i think some of this stuff could could make for like an entire uh, an entire episode and i think it's something we'll probably end up uh, talking more about but uh yeah, it's got some other good questions that I think I want to try to get to on future episodes as well. So thanks, thanks again, Jerry, for writing. And remember, I guess you're about to say it, Dan, but <laughs> write us more questions. Popshieldpod at gmail dot com. It's really, it's really fun. Yeah, well, thanks for fucking up my uh, outro. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see gonna... you next time. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know it. Uh, next episode, we don't know. If you like the show, help us out. Subscribe. Leave a five star review wherever you get it. Stay connected. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that at Pop Shield Pod. And we'll see you in two weeks. See you. So long.